Chapter Thirteen of Venus Boy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Venus Boy by Lee Sutton. Chapter Thirteen. Outwitting the Outlaws. The little red monkey screamed and chattered its hate as johnny and ed stepped through the doorway of the cabin after their eventful flight johnny had noted that the cabin door was the only exit as was usual on venus the exit was a double door when the outer door was open the inner one could not be opened it was just like the school door if Johnny could once get through the outer door and block it open, it would be a while before the men could break the lock on the inner door and get out. Getting out the first door would be a problem, but not too big a problem. The outlaws didn't think they could go into the jungle without armor, so they did not watch him or the door too carefully as soon as they were inside ed took off johnny's oversized armor and locked it away he then winked at the other men and set johnny down in front of him on a high stool you know who i am ed asked him sure you're ed the big man cuffed him so hard he fell from the stool boy he said you never saw me before he frowned making his scarred face as evil as he could when you go back to that colony you're going to forget you ever saw us do you know why from the floor johnny shook his head because if you tell anybody our names or anything about us you know what we're going to do ed asked again johnny shook his head we'll catch you and take you out into the jungle and tie you to a tree without any armor on and leave you for the arrow birds you understand johnny nodded his head they thought they were scaring him they talked a little while longer describing things they might do to him if he told their names, and Johnny pretended to be afraid. All right, Ed said after the lecture. Get back to the kitchen. Can I play with your monkey? Johnny asked. Play with that monkey? Ed's pale eyebrows went up. He'd chew an ear off you. I've been trying to tame him for a month and he don't do anything but bite you leave him alone he won't bite me johnny said i don't think he will the monkey would be a big help in escaping if only they'd let johnny get close to him i'll just go get some sugar cubes from the kitchen let him ed it'll teach the brat a lesson the narrow-faced barney put in okay ed said get bit if you want to johnny rushed through the open door into the kitchen rick was sitting at the table with a book beside him you got any candy rick johnny asked or maybe some sugar cubes you better not fool with that monk johnny rick said he's plenty mean like all the venus creatures he won't hurt me johnny said he saw a box of sugar cubes in the cupboard and grabbed it monkeys just love sweets no rick leaned over and a big freckled hand closed around johnny's small brown one he took the box of sugar away i am going to tell them you got scared only two things will happen if you try playing with that monk you'll get bitten and they'll get a big laugh please let me rick johnny said 
he paused a minute and whispered i've got an idea how i can get away what rick exploded he closed the door and went on in a whisper it's impossible you haven't any armor you don't have any weapons or a tank don't be silly he paused and looked at johnny well how were you going to do it simple said johnny first i make friends with the monkey then i'll let him go and tell him to run around and jump on ed and the rest while they are chasing him i'll open the inside door i'll let him out first and dive through myself i'll wedge open the outside door and by the time they get their armor on and break the lock on the inside door i'll be over the wall and gone the words tumbled out of him rick shook his head johnny that week in the jungle has gone straight to your head in the first place how are you going to make friends with the monkey then how are you going to tell him anything and how are you going to get any armor rick johnny said i don't need any armor oh johnny rick exclaimed exasperated they just won't bother me johnny took a deep breath i can talk to them same as i can talk to the monkey what now listen rick johnny whispered earnestly i wasn't hurt when i came here was i i'd been in the jungle six earth days without any armor rick was looking at him with a strange expression do you remember johnny went on how i looked when you rescued me from the rhinosaur rick nodded did i have any armor on then rick stared at johnny for a few seconds by golly his mouth was slightly open in amazement you didn't have any armor on i wasn't hurt was i rick shook his head slowly no he said but what about that leopard and the rhinosaur the leopard wasn't hurting me johnny said she was trying to get me away before the men got me she was my friend as for the rhinosaur well baba and me hadn't learned for sure about them yet but how can you talk to them rick asked in wonder johnny knew he had no choice he had to trust rick completely it was baba johnny said then very quickly he explained about baba's clicks and told rick about his three secrets jeb said something about those clicks one time rick said thoughtfully i never dreamed it could be true it is true though johnny insisted ed stuck his scarred face through the doorway well kid getting cold feet about the monk no sir johnny said rick was just getting me some cube sugar well hurry it up ed went back out johnny rick said you show me with that monk and by the moons of saturn i'll come with you armor or no armor johnny was bewildered this was something he hadn't counted on he wanted to explain that there was a chance even he alone could not succeed without baba just as johnny started to speak ed appeared in the doorway again well he said in his heavy voice johnny took the sugar cubes from rick and followed ed into the main room as he always did the monkey screamed and chattered at them as they entered the little animal was chained to its perch a spring catch too strong for its tiny 
fingers fastened the chain to its collar and kept it from getting away the outlaws began to gather around you'll have to stay at the table way over at the other end of the room johnny said to the men he's scared of you he pointed to the table which was as far as possible from the door leading outside all right all right the four men seated themselves where johnny pointed ready to watch the fun johnny walked slowly up to the tiny monkey as he did so its little red face twisted and it showed its razor-sharp fangs it screamed at him then it leaped out only to be jerked back cruelly as it came to the end of its chain but it ran out as far as it could and clawed at johnny its eyes red friend pet friend pet johnny clicked very low in the back of his throat the animal stopped screaming and cocked his head at him it looked from one side to the other as if looking for a marva behind johnny johnny repeated the phrase again and again holding the sugar cube out where the red monkey could see it and smell it johnny didn't have any idea how much the little animal could understand but he went on clicking i'm your friend we are going to get away from these men he repeated this many times then he remembered that rick was going to try too you and i and the big man in the other room are going to escape as johnny talked he moved forward soon he was well in range of the little monkey's nails it jumped forward johnny put a sugar cube in its paws with a gurgle of pleasure the monkey swallowed the sugar and put out its paw for more jump on my shoulder johnny clicked the little creature regarded him silently then with a graceful hop it was on his shoulder i don't believe it ed's voice rumbled as soon as the hunter outlaw spoke the little monkey growled and bared his teeth at him the man muttered something under his breath angry that the small boy had done what he couldn't do he started out toward them and was quickly in range of the creature's teeth you'd better not johnny said he'll the monkey dived at ed his teeth slicing into the man's shoulder the outlaw jumped back cursing blood ran down his shirt i'm sorry ed johnny said let me work with him just a little while and maybe he'll make friends with you too in his anger the man had picked up a heavy stick to hit the monkey the other men broke into laughter ed grunted something and threw his stick at the men who were laughing come on he said let's play cards johnny turned back to the monkey for almost half an hour johnny talked to the monkey in the marva clicking language while the outlaws played cards across the room he guessed the little animal could understand a little more than the mother leopard could that wasn't too much but it was enough he made the creature understand that when he was released he was to fly at the men he wasn't to hurt them but make them chase him until johnny could get the door open then the monkey was to leap for the opening the hardest job was getting the monkey to understand that he shouldn't harm rick if the ex-bodyguard came with them johnny wasn't sure the monkey understood with his back turned to the outlaws johnny undid the collar about the monkey's throat 
keeping the little animal out of their sight he walked toward the exit door he picked up an old boot to use on the outer door hey ed suddenly shouted where's the monk after them johnny clicked the monkey leaped at the oncoming ed he clawed his face then leaped at the other men he made great jumps by swinging from the light fixtures by his long black tail ed wheeled and charged like a bull after the tiny screaming creature the kid let the crazy thing loose he shouted catch it shoot him yelled shorty drawing his atto tube pistol from its holster ed knocked it from his hand and it went sliding along the floor want to kill us too you fool in the excitement johnny worked the latch on the exit door and pressed the button that opened it he saw rick halfway through the kitchen door rick reached down and grabbed up something from the floor the monkey was jumping from head to head among the yelling outlaws not one of them noticed what johnny was doing the door was open johnny nodded his head toward rick who came at a dead run when rick was almost there johnny clicked as loud as he could come friend pet come in one leap the little animal sailed across the room and landed on his shoulder johnny and rick pushed through the door slammed it behind them and opened the outside door johnny paused a second and wedged the boot he had picked up into the outer door the outer door could not close and the safety lock would keep the inner door closed come on johnny rick shouted this way he rushed through the helicopter landing space toward the tank entrance rick pulled the switch that opened the doro steel door dive for the nearest tree trunk rick shouted they have gun mounts on the roof johnny ran after rick his short legs unable to keep up with the older man the little monkey was riding on top of his head shrieking and chattering as soon as they reached the forest the monkey jumped into a tree johnny stopped dead he needed that monkey the little animal could tell other animals he and rick were friendly friend pet monkey friend pet monkey he clicked come with me for an instant he was afraid the animal had not heard then with a shock he felt it drop down on his head rick rick he yelled stay with me with relief he heard the big man coming back you gotta stay with me johnny panted arrow birds rick nodded and ran along beside johnny they ran among the great pillars of the diamond wood forest until johnny thought his breath would come no more his feet were heavy against the springing leaves his legs began to twist with fatigue when he was about to fall rick whisked him up in his arms the little monkey screamed and jumped at rick's head no no johnny clicked the tiny creature jumped back on johnny's head but he had left red claw marks on rick's face far in the distance they heard the noise of a tank motor starting the diamond wood trees were beginning to thin out soon they would be in the jungle of meat trees which always surrounded a grove of the giant trees the sound of a helicopter motor starting up was added to the sound of the tank the noise of the tank motor lessened the outlaws had headed in the wrong direction the helicopter was the great danger now hiding under a meat tree with its heavy leaves was their best chance 
we'd better get under something rick johnny said his breath had returned let me down rick nodded his breath was coming in great gasps a heavily leafed tree surrounded by brush was a few hundred yards ahead of them johnny pointed to it and rick nodded johnny prayed that there were no arrow birds feeding there this close to the hunter's lodge there shouldn't be many animals but arrow birds were always on the watch as they worked through the brush to get under the meat tree johnny really missed baba the first branches were too high for either johnny or rick to reach if baba had been there they could have easily climbed up into the protection of the tree leaves and branches luckily the brush was high and thick around it screening them from view from the side the tree itself screened off the sky once they had reached the trunk of the tree they stood wordlessly for a while breathing hard any idea where we are rick johnny asked in a whisper rick's big bony face broke into a smile he reached into a pocket out came a small map of the venus continent not for sure he said but we can't be far from the lodge he pointed to a mark on the map once we see the lay of the land we should be able to tell suddenly rick froze stone still johnny looked up an arrow bird had flown into the tree since its head was not in position to strike it was probably looking for a meat fruit just as johnny saw it his head turned toward them johnny clicked out a sharp command for it to leave them alone as the little purple eyes sought them out its head snapped into striking position but as johnny clicked on it moved its head back to a friendlier position its little purple eyes stared directly at them rick regarded johnny with wonder i don't know what that little bear taught you but it sure is a miracle he said he then reached into his shirt i'm still glad i got this did you see ed knock it out of shorty's hand he pulled an auto tube pistol out of the shirt as soon as the gun came out the red ape leaped from johnny's head screaming the arrow bird snapped its head into position to strike drop it rick drop it johnny yelled amazement swept over rick's face but why bother us not friend pet johnny clicked loudly at the same time he knocked the ato tube from rick's hand he was too late the arrow bird shot with a sickening smack into rick's shoulder almost as quickly it withdrew its blood-stained beak and was hovering in the air for another strike End of chapter 13。Chapter 14 of Venus Boy。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Venus Boy by Lee Sutton. Chapter 14. Captured rick stood rigid his face twisting with pain a hand clutching his upper arm the greenish bird hovered in the air its wings a blur of motion we are friends we are friends bother us not friend pet johnny clicked deep in his throat the bird continued to hover its little purple eyes darting back and forth from johnny to the wounded rick its bloody head stayed in arrow position but it drifted farther away johnny remembered 
that when he had had an arrow bird on his shoulder the others had left him alone he dreaded changing his command but he did come to your friend he clicked firmly the arrow bird stared at him distrustfully but came closer the monkey dropped back on johnny's head with a sigh of relief johnny saw the arrow bird's head snap out of attack position he put out his hand and the arrow bird lit on it are you hurt bad rick he asked the words made the arrow bird flutter with alarm but johnny soothed it by petting it with his other hand rick shook his head not too bad he said through clenched teeth the thing seemed to dodge when you made that clicking noise i'm sorry rick johnny said you just shouldn't have shown that gun you'll have to leave it behind if they think you'd harm any of them they'll kill you just like that the monkeys almost got me because of a pocket knife i didn't know rick said he looked at the bird on johnny's shoulder seems peaceful enough now you'd better let him sit on your shoulder rick johnny looked down at the arrow bird and stroked it again when it was quiet he placed it on rick's shoulder the man was nervous and the bird was worried but they both did as they were told they waited under the tree while the helicopter went back and forth above them johnny looked at rick's wound it didn't look too serious but johnny knew better than to count on that the slightest arrow bird wound could be deadly if not treated johnny had seen hunters brought into the colony sick from an untreated scratch they should have brought an emergency kit but the kits were only carried in special pockets of the armor they let rick's wound bleed to cleanse it as much as possible then johnny bound the arm tightly and made a sling for it from a piece of rick's shirt rick gave johnny his wristwatch to wear since his wrist was hidden by the sling after that they waited it seemed the helicopter would never go away once it hovered almost directly above them but then went on while they waited johnny looked over the map the outlaw hideout was not far from the colony as he had feared they had to start soon and make good time but they just might be able to make it to the meeting place the outlaws had set before johnny's father got there there was a fighting chance if rick didn't get too sick finally they heard the sound of the helicopter landing far in the distance taking direction from the map they set out on their way rick's wound was less painful now but johnny kept his eye on his red-haired friend they started out at a fast clip following an animal track which led in the direction they wanted to go in a few hours of steady marching they were a safe distance from the outlaw hideout johnny's idea was working out several flights of arrow birds had passed them by with no more than a glance in their direction one flight had hovered above them while the arrow bird on rick's shoulder twittered and shrieked to them then they had flown off at top speed a troop of monkeys had also let them pass without doing them any harm hundreds of small red apes had followed along beside them for a time johnny's monkey chattered to them from his perch on the boy's head then they too had swung off through the trees to at top speed rick had been awed for he had never seen 
Venus animals so close except when they were attacking. At first, Rick's strides had been long, and Johnny had had to run every few steps to keep up. Now, Rick's steps were short and slow. He seemed to be getting weaker and weaker. They had stopped and cleansed his wound again at a spring and rebounded, but he was not doing well. The big red-haired man was pale under his freckles. His lips were set tight. Johnny kept close beside him as they moved forward. They had worked out a path to follow that skirted diamond wood groves and avoided rivers. It was too easy to become lost in the dense forest, and Johnny was very unsure of what river snakes would do. Suddenly, Rick stumbled. He stopped and balanced himself by leaning on Johnny's shoulder. He looked at Johnny with bloodshot eyes, sighed, and crumpled up on the ground. The arrow bird that had been sitting on his shoulder hovered in the air above him, making little squeaking noises. He flew toward Johnny and then down an animal trail that led off toward a diamond wood grove. As Johnny leaned over to look at Rick, the monkey jumped from Johnny's head. Johnny stared down at Rick Saunders' face. His cheeks were flushed, but the rest of his face was gray. The little monkey sniffed the wounded man and chattered something at Johnny. Then he, too, ran down the side trail. When Johnny paid no attention, he came up to Johnny and plucked his sleeve, chattering all the while. Johnny looked around. He thought the monkey was drawing his attention to some antelope berries growing down the path. Johnny clicked to the little red monkey to gather some. When the red monkey returned, clutching a cluster of the large berries in each tiny paw, Johnny took them and squeezed the clear red juice into Rick's mouth. The man coughed and turned his face away, but gradually his eyes opened. They were dull and feverish. His hand went to his shoulder and he winced. In the few hours that had passed, his arm and shoulder had already swollen a great deal. He raised his head. Johnny helped him to his feet, but when he staggered, Johnny helped him lie down again on a patch of grass by the antelope berry bush. I can't go any further, Johnny. Rick's voice was hoarse. Those birds must have some kind of poison on their beaks. That wound feels like it's on fire. It's not poison, Rick, Johnny explained. They eat the meat fruit, and little pieces stick to their beaks. The pieces get rotten and infect wounds bad. Johnny remembered that Rick was an earthy and had been on Venus barely a year. There's only one thing to do, Johnny went on. I'll have to light a signal fire with lots of smoke. Somebody'll see us then. Rick shook his head slowly. No, Johnny, it won't do. If those hunters come, they'll get you again, and they're likely to finish me off. You take the map and go on. Rick's voice trailed away. He struggled to sit up. Johnny stepped forward, wondering what was wrong. The monkey leaped off his head and bounded into a tree. Slowly, Rick raised his good arm and pointed directly behind Johnny. Johnny turned. Staring at him, through a bush was a coal-black, saber-toothed leopard, crouched to spring. Friend pet, go away, Johnny clicked in the marva tongue. 
Oh, if Baba were only here. The monkey chattered from a tree. Go away, go away, Johnny repeated. Then he saw a second leopard, a third. None of them was his friend, the mother leopard. These leopards stood almost a foot higher and were solid black. Their saber fangs were a full foot long. These were deadly males, hunting in a pack. The one behind the bush gave a coughing growl. All three slinked slowly toward Johnny and Rick on silent feet, their mouths half open, their white teeth shining. Go away, bother us not, friend pets, bother us not, Johnny repeated. The leopards moved smoothly forward, their steel-like muscles rippling under the shining black fur. Frantically, Johnny turned to Rick, who was struggling to his feet. They won't obey, Rick. Run, Johnny, Rick said. Run for a tree. Rick thrust the boy behind him, but Johnny would not leave his friend. Rick turned pulling Johnny, and started to run. At the same moment, a leopard sprang through the air, high over their heads. A split second later, he was in front of them, barring their way, his gold eyes glistening, his fanged mouth giving forth a low growl. The growl meant, Come. Johnny looked about. Not four steps away was another of the lion-sized cats. They were ringed around by the creatures. Johnny tried clicking again, but they paid no attention. My arm, Johnny, Rick groaned. He ran his hand over his forehead, which was dripping sweat. Slowly his legs gave way, and he fell in a heap beside Johnny. The leopards moved closer, their mouths wide. The one in front was getting so close that Johnny could feel its breath blowing against his bare arm. Then it moved too fast for Johnny to follow. Johnny felt the great jaws close around his middle, and he was hurled off his feet. Frantically he beat at the big head. The jaws tightened, gripping him painfully. As Johnny cried out in pain, he saw the other two leopards leap upon Rick. A few seconds later, Johnny was being carried down the path in the jaws of the monster cat. The jaws had tightened no more than was necessary to hold him firmly as the animal trotted along. From this strange position, Johnny witnessed an even stranger sight. Behind the leopard carrying Johnny strode the two others. Side by side they walked, dividing Rick Saunders' weight between them. One had its jaws about Rick's arms and shoulders. The other held his hips and legs. They moved along easily, their heads held high so that his feet would not drag on the ground. Then Johnny saw that his arrow bird friend was riding on the shoulder of one of the leopards that was carrying Rick. He heard a chattering noise and knew that the little red monkey was close by. The leopards were taking them some place, but who could know where? In his odd position, Johnny could not tell even the direction they were going. But soon they were in the patchwork shadow of a meat tree forest. Here the leopards had their lairs, but they did not stop. They went on and on. Johnny kept trying to watch the leopards which carried Rick. Once in a while he could catch a glimpse of them, Rick's head bobbing as they moved. He was still unconscious. Then Johnny heard a shout and a scuffling noise. 
the leopard carrying him turned around rick was conscious his head was turning about wildly and he was yelling his eyes lit on johnny what's happening he all but screamed they're taking us somewhere johnny answered they haven't hurt me yet rick was kicking his feet and struggling making it hard for the leopards to walk johnny could see their jaws tightening as rick struggled you better not fight rick johnny said you can't get away and they'll just hurt you more i'll tell them you won't fight if they'll hold you easier he clicked the message to the big cats his own leopard turned back up the trail and he couldn't see what the other leopards did a few seconds later he heard rick's voice you were right johnny when i eased up they eased up too then he laughed in a strained way i wish they'd eat us right now and get it over with maybe they won't they said no more they were coming to the edge of the meat tree grove as was often the case the last group of meat trees was beside a river beyond was a diamond wood grove the three animals plunged into the cool water and soon were swimming with johnny's and rick's heads held well above the water on the opposite bank they dived into the shadow of the diamond wood grove as soon as they entered the grove johnny was startled to see that there were several antelope walking beside them then suddenly the little red monkey he had rescued from ed was squatting on the leopard's back johnny heard a swishing sound almost under his head by twisting hard he could see the ground there was a river snake crawling beside them its ugly horned head was right beneath him it was the first time he had ever seen one then his heart leaped he heard the clicking of the marble language johnny twisted his body against the leopard's teeth trying to see where the clicking was coming from the leopard growled and johnny lay still again take the big killer to the healer the voice clicked the little killer take to the council the clicks were somehow different from baba's firmer and louder but johnny could understand them perfectly johnny caught sight of the two leopards carrying rick they were turning down another path the river snake and the antelope took the same path but johnny's leopard went on forward after a short time the leopard stopped and very carefully opened its jaws and eased johnny to the ground it turned and walked a few steps away there it crouched johnny got slowly to his feet the little red monkey jumped on his head the arrow bird perched on his shoulder in a clearing among the diamond wood trees johnny stood in the center of a circle of jewel bears their blue nails glowing in the half light all but one or two were dark about the muzzle they sat on their haunches staring straight at johnny end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of venus boy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by shasta oakland california venus boy by lee sutton chapter fifteen a city in the trees except for faint animal sounds in the distance there was silence in the diamond wood grove more marva than any other person had ever seen surrounded johnny 
most of them were dark muzzled and very old from old jeb's hunting tales johnny knew that as a marva grows older the fur about its muzzle darkens a jewel bear with a black muzzle is a rare thing this was no ordinary group of marva but a gathering of elders they seemed neither friendly nor unfriendly they seemed to be waiting patiently for johnny to do something hello johnny broke the silence greeting them in their own clicking language i'm very glad to see you once started johnny had so much to say the words fairly rushed from him your leopards sure scared us maybe you can tell me how to get to some people quick before it knew we wouldn't hurt it this arrow bird wounded my friend and he's very sick and baba's got caught again and some bad men are trying to get him if you could help us get back to the colony oh i'd thank you baba's a marva you know just like you and he's my best friend we tried to find you but the outlaws captured me and baba and went home because i'm his friend pet brother and he thought i'd be there rick will die if you the torrent of words was cut short by a marva with a coal-black muzzle he stood up and raised both blue paws for silence it was well reported that the little killer can speak our language he clicked with a sound very like a human chuckle you speak well he clicked to johnny but you speak too much at once a ripple of amusement passed over the faces of the jewel bears then they became stern once more you must try to tell a little at a time the old marva continued but first let me answer one of your questions for i think you are full of questions the red furred killer has been sent to the healers he will soon be treated we heard of you and of the wound from our friend pets you need not worry little killer our healers have had many wounds to deal with since your kind has been in the green lands you mean you will fix up my friend johnny asked you have doctors yes little killer the black muzzled one answered but he won't understand johnny said he wouldn't let any of you touch him not unless i talk to him follow the leopard then he will take you to the healers then return here the black muzzled marvo waved his paw and the leopard rose and trotted off johnny ran beside him in another clearing johnny paused in amazement it was filled with many animals he saw several rhinosaurs with great gaping atotube wounds a leopard with a cut on its shoulder lay whimpering before a marva who was squeezing the juice of some berries upon the cut fascinated johnny watched as the marva sewed up the cut a fine piece of marva claw for his needle the berry's juice must have killed the pain for the leopard stopped whimpering and lay very still then johnny saw rick he was lying on his back but his eyes were open the two leopards were right beside him their heavy paws holding him down rick johnny called running up to him get away from here rick yelled 
there's a horned snake right beside me he'll kill us no johnny answered if he wanted to he could have done it long ago rick we're safe the leopards brought you here to get your wound fixed up then he clicked to the leopards let him go he won't run away he turned back to rick i just told the leopards you won't run away he explained just watch the marva over there unsteadily rick got to his feet he quickly sat down again overcome by weakness and amazement he had caught sight of the marva healers at work one was sewing up a rhinosaur another was splinting up the leg of an antelope rick shook his head i'm dreaming he said i must be isn't it wonderful johnny said they're going to fix your wound too the leopard beside him growled in the way johnny knew meant come i gotta go now johnny said good-bye and don't worry let them do what they want to do johnny and the leopard made their way among the sick animals johnny let out a cry of pleasure there was his friend the leopardess the atotube burn was not a bad one and it had already been treated she rose when she saw him though the big male leopard growled his disapproval johnny ran over and patted her and her cubs before he went on is she a friend of yours johnny was startled by the sudden appearance of the black muzzled marva who had spoken to him earlier yes old one johnny answered respectfully come the marva addressed the leopardess the two leopards the cubs johnny and the marva walked off together soon johnny was in the circle of marva again this time he was over his surprise and he tried to tell his story as clearly as he could he was beginning to get worried about the time that was passing and he looked at rick's watch again and again there was always the chance that the outlaws would try to get baba even though they no longer had johnny to give in return but he told his story as best he could in spite of his worry he had to explain all about men on venus he even had to tell where men came from since the jewel bears had never seen stars or planets in their sky he told about overcrowded earth and his father's desire to make a colony he told about the hunters and trader harkness he told about his trip into the jungle and how the outlaws had captured him and finally of his escape with rick into the jungle the group of marva listened carefully sometimes they nodded their heads in approval of what he had done and sometimes they seemed puzzled but they seemed more friendly when he had finished when at last he came to a halt the old marva who was acting as spokesman for the group arose you say this young marva friend of yours is named baba the old one used the word in the clicking language for baba's name yes we have heard of him the black muzzled marva clicked though he was not of our grove his mother and brother were killed we have wondered why he was not killed too since your people feel we are your enemies our observer on council rock has watched your people often but has 
seeing little we can understand tell us why baba was not killed at first i already explained johnny said his teeth and claws were black now they are blue and of course he's worth a lot of money what is this money the black muzzled one asked johnny was surprised the word baba used for money must not be a real marva word if only baba was here to explain johnny tried the best he could to explain how money works the marva shook its head in wonder at the strange ways of men but why do you want our claws and teeth the marva asked to make rings and plastic but they understood neither the word ring nor the word plastic johnny had to explain that plastic was the material that head globes were made from he explained also that rings and jewelry were used for decoration and that is why we are killed on sight asked the marva yes old one it made johnny sad for himself for the marva and for his people to have to admit this his answer caused a stir among the marva i have one more question the old marva said why did you come into the jungle with the marva baba he would have died or been killed otherwise and he was my brother or like my brother it was like the song he sang you help your friends and your friends help you it is the law and will be the law as the trees stand between friend and friend there is no parting more than the fingers of a hand we know the song the marva said gently but didn't you think these the marva gestured at the leopards might kill you yes johnny said but i had to take the chance they asked many more questions about men and their ways many were hard for johnny to answer or even to understand but he tried very hard to be as clear and truthful as possible finally they seemed satisfied and there was again silence in the diamond wood grove with a nod to johnny the black muzzled marva led the rest of the jewel bears away and left johnny and his animal friends alone a short distance away the marva again formed a circle and clicked together quietly then they called over his friend the leopardess the red monkey and the arrow bird they appeared to be asking them questions johnny left to himself wondered what was happening it was all very strange rick's wristwatch said too much time had passed already the black muzzled marva returned to johnny come with me he clicked and walked toward one of the great trees one of the younger jewel bears waited at the foot of the tree grasp him by the shoulders the black muzzled marva directed johnny and hold tight johnny found he could ride easily on his back the marva started up the tree at a breathtaking speed the full-grown marva climbed three times as fast as baba without anything on his back down below them the black muzzled marva followed with the slow dignity of age up and up they went the full two hundred feet toward the sky johnny looked down at the sick animals and the healers they looked very small now finally 
Johnny and the marva reach the branches. As they come up to the first huge branch, it appeared to move slowly away from the trunk of the tree to reveal a large opening. The tip of the branch was fastened to a branch above. Two huge snakes, the color of the branch, were coiled about it. These snakes had pulled the branch from the opening so that the marva and Johnny could enter. Johnny could see that the branch had been hollowed out until it was fairly light. Once inside, Johnny's eyes were dazzled by light. The young marva started back down the tree. In a few moments, the black-muzzled marva was before Johnny again. He made a little bow. Man-child, he clicked. Welcome to the tree of Keetak, leader of the council of this grove. May you have long life. Thank you. It was the only thing Johnny could think of to say. Before him was a beautiful room. There were finely woven grass mats upon the floor, and in places about the room piles of mats and soft blue and delicate pinks made places to sit. The room was flooded with light that came from directly over their heads. The walls were made of the living wood of the tree, carved with many scenes of Venus and colored to make beautiful designs. Johnny looked up to see where the light came from. He gasped. Above them was a great cluster of marva teeth and claws glowing with light. When Ki Tak, the leader of the council, moved forward, the light floated along the ceiling, following him. Finally, Johnny realized what the light was. It was a cluster of large Venus fireflies, each clasped a marva claw in its tiny feet. As the insect glowed, the claw multiplied the light. In the middle of the ceiling was a hive where the fireflies lived. Johnny watched with wonder as the flies went back and forth from hive to light. Katak noticed Johnny's interest. As one becomes tired, he said, another takes his place. We give them food and they give us light. Is it not a good system? Suddenly Johnny understood, and the rhinosaurs protect you from the sea beasts, and we help them when they are sick or hurt. We help take care of their marsh berries and see that they have food. All living things are our friends, but the killers of the sea. Gee, said Johnny, it's just perfect. The little bear appeared to laugh. Hardly, he clicked. We have our quarrels, too, and many of our friends sometimes forget. That's right, Johnny said. The monkeys sure didn't trust those leopards until after we got here. It is hard for many of them, Keetak went on. I often wonder what the rhinosaurs will do when there is nothing left to fight. We are already beginning to make friends with the killers of the sea. Not long ago, the arrow birds were killers, and it was only in the lifetime of my great-grandfather's great-great-grandfather's father that we made friends with the river snakes, so that they too do as we advise them to do. You mean obey you? Johnny asked. In a way, Keetak answered, most of the animals obey us, but they don't obey your little ones, Johnny was excited. It's only when your blue teeth come in. 
and your voice gets deeper that other animals will obey you. Isn't that right? Yes, said Keetak. We say a deep voice is a sign of the coming of wisdom. Then that's why the arrow birds obeyed Baba and me. Yes, Keetak nodded. Now, would you like to see the remainder of our tree? Please, Johnny answered politely. It's a lot like the caves of New Plymouth Rock. Indeed so, said the marva leader. These caves served as a yearly meeting place of the council of all the groves. No one tree was large enough for all to live in while we talked together. Before your people came to the green lands, we had happy times there each year. Now we use the rock only for watching you. I'm sorry, Johnny said. Come now, Keetak clicked. I will show you the tree. Johnny would have been terribly excited by the suggestion if it hadn't been for his fear that they were taking too much time. The whole upper part of the tree was honeycombed with rooms. Each level was connected by a winding passage as in the caverns of New Plymouth Rock. Each was lit in the same way. It was not Keetax tree alone. Several Marma families lived there together. As they entered each level, a Marva would come forward and welcome Johnny. He was fascinated by the little ones who grinned at him just as Baba did. The Marva cubs always came in twos, peeking around from the back of the mothers were always two pairs of bright blue eyes. But one family was different. Johnny and Keetak entered that level to the sound of growling and tumbling and scratching. In the middle of the room, a small bear bounced hard on the floor and up to the ceiling where it clung like a fly. Below it, a coal-black leopard cub growled in a way Johnny understood. It was a pleading growl, saying, Come. As soon as the baby bear, hanging on the ceiling, saw Johnny and Keetak, he dropped to the floor and stood with his arm around the black leopard cub. A mother marva came rushing from another room. I'm sorry my cubs were so rude, she clicked, but you know how much mischief one of ours and a friend pet brother can get into. Of course, Keetak clicked. This is the friend pet brother of one of ours, so he will understand. Oh, yes, Johnny said. Then he looked over at the two cubs. The little marva was still very small and had black claws. He shows off just like Baba used to, Johnny exclaimed. Johnny remembered the trouble his mother had had with Baba's game of walking on the ceiling. With that they went on, but Johnny touched Keetak on the shoulder. Though the bear was old, he came to no more than to Johnny's shoulder. The leopard cub was that Marva cub's friend pet brother, just as Baba is mine? Johnny asked. For the first time, the Marva seemed to smile, opening his mouth wide, as Baba did when he grinned. We would say you were his friend pet brother, the black-muzzled one clicked. Perhaps it is better to say you are friend brothers. It is not strange. Many of us have had companions of another race. Why is this? Johnny asked eagerly. 
You have seen that our cubs always come in pairs. The pair is almost one until they are grown. Keetak explained, if only one cub is born or one of a pair dies, we give the lone cub a friend pet, a cub of another race to grow up with him. They become brothers, just as you and Baba did. Without this, the lone cub would die. Cubs need the love of a brother as much as they need food. It is sometimes a very good thing, for in this way our friends of the plains and the groves are knitted to us with ties of very deep love. Now I understand why Baba would never leave me, Johnny said and then he went on earnestly and you should understand why i've got to get back to baba in the colony there may still be some way i can save him but i don't have much more time i can make no promise yet to let you go Keetak said still there may be a way we can save your friend brother and do something more besides he would say no more soon they were back in keetak's rooms you will wait here keetak said johnny seated himself on one of the piles of mats and waited he didn't quite understand what was going on but he wished keetak would hurry he looked at rick's watch it had been twelve hours since he had spoken to his father on ed's radio telephone he had only an earth day and a half to get to the settlement if he were to keep baba out of ed's hands a few minutes later keetak re-entered the room surrounded by some of the furry bears who lived in his tree my friend he clicked i have a gift from the people of my tree to your people those whom you say are making a colony it is a gift of friendship and a gift of peace if the council of the grove decides to let you go back i hope you can use these to pay for the life of your friend and brother baba in his hand the marva held a small package wrapped with woven rushes thank you johnny said and took the package you may unwrap it johnny folded back the stiff material and gasped in his hand glowed a pile of marva claws hundreds of them End of chapter 15。15。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Venus Boy by Lee Sutton. Chapter 16 the thunder of rhinosaur hooves a worried johnny was standing in the centre of the clearing once more surrounded by the little jewel bears he now knew this was the grove council a group of the wisest bears of the grove he tacks gift to johnny had impressed them all they knew it meant that Ketak trusted johnny yet they were cautious johnny's knowledge of them could be very dangerous it is not right he should go one of the marva was saying his muzzle was still blue and johnny knew this meant he was younger than the rest the young killer will return to his people and tell of our ways and our houses in the trees 
then the older killers will come with their death-spitting things and our lives will be gone i think that we should hold him here otherwise we risk the lives of our people johnny put up his hand as if he were in school the marva keytack of the deep black muzzle pointed at johnny may i talk now johnny asked the marva nodded i won't tell anything you don't want me to he promised earnestly with these claws i'm sure baba can be saved but i'm going to have to hurry if the outlaws get him they will kill him sure don't you understand we understand the old marva answered but we must be sure of safety for us and our people your people are killers like the beasts of the sea you even kill each other you are a strange people still you risk your life for your friend baba just as baba would risk his your friend with the red fur risked his life to help you do you really think that if your people knew all there is to know about us they would not come with the fire-spitting things johnny was silent he knew ed would come he knew traitor harkness would too he swallowed for lying to these little bears was something he just couldn't do for those claws some of my people would do anything he clicked in a low voice there was complete silence in the grove the marva who was young and still blue furred about the muzzle stood again johnny wanted to cry he had condemned baba to death but if he hadn't done so maybe all the marva would be killed he felt they too were his brothers he broke into sobs and stood there with tears running down his cheeks we have heard our young friend the blue furred marva said it was the first time he had not called johnny a killer he gave us the truth because we have trusted him and treated him with friendship i was wrong he is to be trusted let him go from here with his gifts my tree too will send a gift but let him promise to keep secret anything he thinks may be dangerous to us the marva seated himself oh i promise johnny said solemnly cross my heart and hope to die it is agreed among us then keetak asked the group the furry heads nodded their agreement young friend you may go your settlement is three groves away from us you may have a rhinosaur to ride it will take you home with time to spare you go with a pledge of peace we will send messages ahead and no animals will attack you nor will any of our friends attack any man unless he attacks first you may tell your people we will give them more claws for such things as we would like from them every two years we marva get a new set of claws and teeth the old ones have been saved from generation to generation to be used for lights and for tools you may also tell the leaders of your people we would like to meet with them perhaps we can make a friendship that will endure johnny had a busy hour ahead of him first he ran to see rick among the sick animals in the other part of the grove there was no question of rick's coming with him he was still too sick from the arrow bird's wound but 
he was definitely on the mend he was lying under a tree petting the leopard cubs johnny told him what had happened carefully omitting where the marva lived and rick became more and more interested finally johnny showed him one of the packets of claws that he had been given by now the packets had grown to over a dozen and he had placed them in a bag made from his shirt johnny rick said you've done a most wonderful thing those marvas don't have to worry about being hunted any more if people can get so many of those claws and teeth no one will ever want to hunt for them again you tell them that for me johnny rushed to give the news to the marva the first one he found was the young council member who had at first opposed letting him go it pays to trust one another the marva said simply soon johnny was ready the leader of the council brought before him a huge rhinosaur one of the biggest johnny had ever seen skorkin knows he must obey you he tack said he will do anything you ask and will harm none of your people hello friend pet johnny said the rhinosaur turned and looked at him with his little blue-black eyes and grunted a greeting johnny noted it it probably meant hello was that his speech johnny asked yes he tack answered they have more words than the other creatures of the green lands only the monkeys of all our friend pets come near to being as smart as they they are a people too of great courage i know johnny said he remembered the rhinosaur charge at the colony at the mention of the word monkey the little red ape whom johnny had rescued from ed began to chatter and jump up and down he likes you and wishes to go with you Keetak said do you want him to oh yes johnny answered the monkey leaped to his shoulder johnny suddenly had an idea could the leopardess her cubs and the arrow bird come too he asked that is if they want to he tack understood what was in johnny's mind and nodded his approval it's a good idea he clicked it would be a good way to prove to your people that the animals can be friendly the leopardess was suddenly beside johnny rubbing up against him like a big cat she looked up into his face and growled in the way that johnny knew meant come johnny looked at the wristwatch we do have to hurry he threw the bag full of the precious claws over his shoulder and stepped toward the rhinosaur how am i going to get on he asked with sudden surprise a series of grunts came from the rhinosaur that sounded something like laughter then it lay its horned snout upon the ground and grunted again climb on he tack said grasping one of the long snout horns johnny climbed aboard his strange mount all around hundreds of the mava were hanging from their trees they waved and he waved back let's go he clicked to the rhinosaur and so began the race through the jungle the great rhinosaur moved forward with thundering speed the leopardess and her cubs loping along beside them when one of the cubs grew tired it leaped on to the rhinosaur's back 
curled up beside Johnny and went peacefully to sleep. The arrow bird perched on one of the beast's horns and the monkey beside it. They did not stop for rain or rivers. Everywhere the jungle seemed to have blossomed forth with animals who waved and grunted, growled, clicked, or sang greetings to them as they went past. The broad back of the rhinosaur was a perfect place to travel, Johnny found. It swayed hardly as much as a helicopter, and bounced much less than a tank. It was not long until Johnny had followed the leopard cub's example. He found a hollow in the big back, curled up and went to sleep, lulled by the steady swinging movement and the thunder of the rhinosaur's hoofs. Johnny woke with a start. The monkey was pulling on one of his ears. They had reached the settlement. Johnny glanced down at his watch. He had slept six hours. The rhinosaur had stopped right at the edge of the meat tree grove that bordered the settlement through the screen of trees johnny could see the high gray walls it was about half a mile to the gate johnny wiped the sleep out of his eyes and puzzled as to the best way of making his appearance go that way johnny clicked and pointed but stay where you can't be seen from the walls at a slow trot, the rhinosaur carried them to a place directly in front of the gate to the settlement wall. Johnny saw that the gate had been repaired. Beside it was a steel door through which a single man could be admitted. You wait here for me, he said to the animals. Let me down, friend rhinosaur. He tied his bag of claws to the rhinosaur's horn and then walked down the huge head to the ground. The arrow bird flew over and lit on his shoulder. It had not understood. Wait, Johnny repeated. Wait, I will come back. The rhinosaur wandered a few yards away and began to munch on some bushes. The leopard growled to her cubs and began to climb a meat tree in search of food. Johnny smiled. They were good friends to have. Johnny slipped through the bushes and trees until only one antelope berry bush was between him and the wall. The guard tower was directly in front of him. The men in the tower must have noticed the swaying of the bushes, for they were looking directly toward the spot where Johnny stood. Johnny slipped from behind the bush and stepped into full view. He smiled and waved jauntily to the guards. As casually as he could, he started toward the door. Halfway there, he began to skip for sheer joy. The guards were staring at him, open-mouthed. Obviously, he had no armor on. He had had to use his shirt to make the bag for the claws. The only clothes he wore was the baggy pair of shorts Rick had made him. The steel door at the base of the guard tower opened at his touch. He closed it carefully opened the inner door, and then climbed the stairs to the guard tower, instead of going straight into the colony. There, too, were double doors. Hello, he said as he entered. The three guards on duty were so surprised they couldn't speak for a second. One of them was old Jeb. Before they recovered, Johnny went up to Jeb. Would you call my father, Jeb, and tell him to come to the gate? It was funny to watch their faces. Johnny, you're safe, 
Jeb suddenly exploded. He swept the boy into his arms and swung him about. He stopped, pushed the boy away from him, and tousled his hair. I can't believe it, but you're safe. Sure I am, Johnny said with a grin. Then he became serious. How is Baba? Is he all right? He's been kind of sad and upset, poor little feller, Jeb said. But how in thunder did you get here? Last we heard you were being held for ransom. Your folks have been worried sick. Oh, I got away from the outlaws, and some friends brought me. Please call everybody in the colony, will you? Tell them to come to the gate. I have something important to show them. I've got to go back out to my friends now. Bye. He started toward the door. Friends? What friends? Jeb called. You'll find out, Johnny said with a laugh. Hey, you can't go outside without armor, one of the other guards shouted. But Johnny had slipped out before he could be stopped. He took the stairs at a run, and was out of the heavy steel wall doors before the men could follow him. As he skipped across the open space back to the jungle, he turned his head, waved to the men in the tower, and smiled. "'Come back here, you little devil!' Jeb shouted through the loudspeaker the guards used to guide tanks in. But Johnny shook his head and went back into the brush. Johnny waited for about ten minutes. All this time, the loudspeaker in the tower was shouting for Johnny to come back in. Finally, the voice changed. It was Johnny's father's voice. Johnny, his father said over the speaker, come on in here, please. I'm here now, Johnny. Johnny heard a tank starting up inside. He didn't want any tanks coming after him. Come on, friends, he clicked to the animals. He climbed back up on the rhinosaur's back. The leopard came running up with her cubs. The arrow bird and the monkey, taking no chances, followed behind them, leaped to its usual perch on top of Johnny's head. Let's go, Johnny clicked to the rhinosaur. Walk very slowly out toward the big black place. Johnny clicked to one of the cubs to jump up on the rhinosaur's back beside him. Johnny crawled to the broad head of the rhinosaur between two of its horns. The leopard cub sat on its haunches beside him. The mother leopard and the other cub ran alongside them. The rhinosaur's hooves made muffled thunder as he walked. A big grin on his face and waving his hand, Johnny emerged from the jungle into full sight of his father, Jeb, and many others inside the guard tower. Stop when we get a little way from the door. Johnny said to the rhinosaur. The big beast grunted its understanding. Johnny and his friends came to a halt close enough to the tower so that Johnny's voice could be heard. Open the gate, please, Johnny shouted. We want to come inside. He saw his father's startled face above him. Hello, Dad. How's Mom? Did she worry too much? Hello, son, the father's voice was shocked. Your mother is all right, he paused. Where did you... How did you... You mean the animals, Johnny asked, rather enjoying the effect he was making. Oh, they're friends of mine. You can let us in. They won't hurt anybody. I'm bringing a present to pay for Baba and make up for all the harm we did. Look. He 
he took a packet of the claws and opened it he let a handful of the claws run out of one hand into the other in a shining blue waterfall through the microphone he could hear his father and the other men gasp come in here quick frederick watson's voice came back over the loudspeaker open the gates please johnny repeated but the rhinosaur and the leopard they're friends of mine they brought me here they won't hurt anybody i promise the big steel gate slowly opened riding on the back of one of the great feared rhinosaurs johnny entered the colony it seemed that everyone in the colony had heard of johnny's strange return pioneers men women and children hunters and guards were hurrying toward the big gate at the sight of the rhinosaur a woman screamed and the crowd ran scattering in all directions captain thompson two other colonists and a hunter held their ground their ato pistols out don't shoot don't shoot johnny shouted beneath him the rhinosaur trembled he won't hurt you he's our friend he stroked the animal bird on his shoulder look even an arrow bird slowly the ato tube pistols that had been leveled at them were lowered hesitantly one or two of the people began to move back toward the little group a woman came running toward johnny it was his mother tears were running down her face even she was finally stopped by the bewildering sight of her son surrounded by jungle animals let me down johnny clicked to the rhinosaur the big animal lowered his head a cry went up from the people as the leopardess bounded after him johnny threw his arms around his mother oh johnny johnny his mother said over and over holding him tight against her armor she stiffened as the mother leopard rubbed against them and the arrow bird lit for a moment on her shoulder mother i want you to meet my friends johnny said this is mona the leopardess and her two cubs pat and mike and this is skimpy the monkey i haven't named my arrow bird yet then he spoke to the animals this is my mother johnny's mother stood there a moment too bewildered to speak the leopardess licked her hand then johnny led his mother to the rhinosaur this is my friend skorkin the rhinosaur he gave me a ride all the way here isn't he beautiful then he clicked to the rhinosaur this is my mother the huge creature grunted skorkin said hello johnny said her eyes wide with the strangeness of it all johnny's mother nodded a wordless greeting to the creature just then johnny heard a sound he had been waiting for it was the sound of a basketball dropped from a height he looked up to see baba bounding along as fast as he could come johnny was off at a dead run to meet him leaving his mother and the other animals behind the two of them met at top speed and they met with such impact that both were tumbled to the ground in a heap of arms legs boy and bear both of them were laughing when they got to their feet oh baba you bad little bear johnny said i thought i'd never see you again and i baba said you shouldn't have come back here johnny said 
I'll have to punish you right now. He grabbed Baba suddenly by the leg, whirled him around and around his head, and threw him as high as he could in the air. Throwing his arms around as if frightened to death, the little bear whimpered and clicked, but just before he hit the ground, he made himself into a ball and bounced higher than Johnny had thrown him. Then, on the third bounce, he landed lightly on Johnny's shoulder. Their delight was cut short by the sight of a fat, bald man who glittered as he walked toward the crowd. For an instant, Johnny was afraid. It was Trader Harkness. Then he remembered. The trader's days of power were over. Mr. Harkness, he called. I've got something to show you. They said you had claws, the trader's little black eyes fixed their gaze on Johnny. Come on, I'll show everybody. The crowd parted for Johnny and Baba and the trader. By this time, almost all the colonists and visiting hunters were gathered around the rhinosaur and the leopards. A few bold souls were timidly petting the cubs. Probably of most interest was the arrow bird. Tired from all its riding, it had put its head under its wing and gone fast asleep, perched on the rhinosaur's horn. Johnny took the bag he had made from the shirt down from where it hung beside the arrow bird. He untied it, revealing the many packets made from woven rushes. Packet after packet, he spilled the claws out onto the shirt until there was a great pile of jewels glowing before the people. Where did you get them? Trader Harkness' voice rumbled. He was shocked and pale. The marva themselves gave them to me for the colony, Johnny replied. It's a sign that they and all the animals want to be our friends. The trader forced his eyes away from the pile of jewels and looked over his shoulder. Johnny was suddenly conscious of three hunters standing behind the trader. Ed and his gang. I'll take those claws now, the trader said. The gang whipped out their attitudes and leveled them at Johnny and Baba. The crowd gasped and then fell silent. Johnny's father stepped up but one of the hunters waved him back with his gun. Johnny saw he'd been wrong. There was plenty of fight left in the trader. He glanced around him. The animals had become very still, waiting his word. Friends, Johnny clicked, stay still. This man is a killer. Skorkin, the dinosaur, snorted. The arrow bird awoke and snapped his head into arrow position. The monkey bared his teeth, while Mona the leopardess crouched to spring, the muscles of her haunches trembling. Johnny saw the trader's eyes widen. The leopard was not three feet away from him. Thinking fast, Johnny stepped carefully over and put a hand on the leopard's shoulder. I wouldn't move, Mr. Harkness, Johnny said, his voice quavering in spite of himself. If you don't tell your gang to give their guns to Captain Thompson, I'll tell the animals to charge. Maybe Ed told you what I made the monkey do. Johnny's heart raced. It was a bluff. He couldn't tell the animals to charge. He knew they might be killed. No amount of claws would be worth that. The trader's eyes were fixed on Mona. 
then skorkin snorted again eager to fight the trader turned brick red do what the kid says he said in a low strangled voice the attitude in ed's hand wavered and then came down there was a deep sigh of relief from the crowd grimly and quietly captain thompson gathered up the guns all right you men he said there's a room ready for you at the stockade the fight was really gone from the trader now his shoulders slumped his head down he shuffled as he was led away johnny's father stepped forward and embraced him i don't understand how you did it johnny he said i don't understand anything about it but this is certainly a wonderful day End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Venus Boy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Venus Boy by Lee Sutton Chapter 17 Teachers can't play hooky it was now an hour after the earth rocket had blasted off on its way back to earth johnny watson lay on his stomach with his chin cupped in his hands and looked down from the top of new plymouth rock beside him twisted into the same position was his friend baba his blue nails glowing in venus pearly light near the two friends perched on a boulder were two of the large venus eagles watching every move they made how changed it all was down in the settlement people were streaming back from the rocket field on foot and without armor Beside the Jenkins family strode Mona, the leopardess, carrying a basket in her mouth. In the basket, the Jenkins baby slept. Mona just loved babies. Down in the marshberry fields, three rhinosaurs peacefully browsed. There were so many berries available now in the sea marshes that no one had to worry about the few in the fields. The marva had left these three rhinosaurs to carry people wherever they might want to go. High in the sky was a faint dot. Baba nudged Johnny and pointed. Here comes Keetak, he said in his clicking language. We'll have to go down pretty soon i suppose so johnny said wearily it had been fun for a while being the only person who understood the marva language when dad and the other colonists had gone into the jungle to talk with the council of all the marva groves johnny and baba had been there too the center of attention when the men spoke baba told the marva what they meant when the marva spoke johnny had to tell the men what the bears meant it had been fun being so important it had been fun being treated like heroes but they were already tired of it with their new freedom to travel there was a whole continent to explore and hundreds of new friends to make idly johnny watched the dot that baba said was keetak growing into a bird with a twenty-foot wing spread flying through the sky in its claws was a small black muzzled bouncing bear baba's eyes were magically good the bird was a venus eagle the marva's airplane 
before men had come and made it dangerous for them the marva had flown anywhere they wanted to go in the talons of these great birds johnny knew that the earliest hunters thought the eagles were preying upon the bears it was just one more surprising thing about the little bears johnny remembered what rick had said when he had arrived home his wound all healed he had really grown to respect the marva they have learned to live with other creatures and have taught all their friends as they call the animals to live in peace together the meat-eaters have their meat trees so they don't need to attack other animals it's amazing rick reported johnny remembered how baba had preened himself when rick had spoken that way and he smiled hey baba johnny said how soon do you think we could take a trip all around the groves we could get skorkin to carry us and go visit everybody you will have to come stay with my people baba said only a few days before baba had discovered a host of aunts uncles and cousins in one of the outlying groves most important of all he had found his father i've lived with you for years and years now it should be your turn oh good said johnny we'll do it soon as they'll let us go look johnny baba pointed look at the trader below the fat bald-headed little man a pack on his back was heading into the jungle he waddled as he walked but he moved straight along where's he going baba asked dad says he's going to start a marshberry farm if the marva will let him but gosh it'll be a long time before anyone will help him he can always live on meat fruit and stuff baba said nobody likes him but they won't bother him if he leaves them alone what had happened to the trader and to the outlaws was the strangest thing of all the marva had not wanted them punished they said they wanted to make friends not enemies the thousands of marva claws that had been given to the colony had made the claws quite cheap so that trader harkness had become a poor man he had been rich in hunting equipment and hunting lodges now all these things were valueless surprisingly he had refused to return to earth venus is my home he had said flatly i'll get by johnny had to admire his courage just as he had to admire some of the hunters who would not stay on venus these lean hard-bitten men were going further on into space to johnny's surprise keetak admired the hunters too they are fighters like the rhinosaurs here there is nothing left to fight they are people of much courage looking down on the trader johnny found he couldn't help feeling sorry for him good-bye he yelled his voice echoing among the rocks good-bye trader the fat man looked up and waved back johnny thought he smiled he was a real pioneer johnny said yes baba answered he'll be all right johnny jumped back suddenly from the edge of the rock and hid behind some bushes here comes mom looking for us baba quickly dived back out of sight too johnny peeked through the screening of bushes his mother was riding toward the rock on Skorkin, the rhinosaur. This hyduck was not very secret. 
everybody on venus knew about it he stood up and waved down to her i'm coming mother he shouted his mother nodded and the big rhinosaur turned back toward the settlement in a few minutes baba and johnny would be back in school sitting in front of a group of men and a group of marva baba would be teaching the marva how to understand the talk of people while johnny taught the men and women how to talk and understand the language of the marva it was a hard job i guess we gotta go back johnny mourned i guess so baba agreed sadly there is only one trouble with being a teacher said johnny teachers just can't play hooky then he grinned say i've got an idea what asked baba mom hasn't been doing her homework let's give a test today baba slapped his furry haunches his blue teeth glowing let's go johnny clicked to the two eagles he ran as hard as he could and leaped off the edge of the high cliff hurtling down and down right after him baba jumped too there was the sound of great wings and the true tremendous venus eagles swept after them one dived at johnny its claws spread the long powerful claws hooked into johnny's belt and whisked him through the air toward the settlement the other grasped baba by the shoulders together the two friends flew on that was fun said johnny his furry blue pal nodded his agreement End of chapter 17